Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to tonight's meeting. I'm Daniel Zeichner. I'm Labour's parliamentary candidate for Cambridge, as I was at the last general election. For tonight's purposes, I'm also a member of Labour's National Policy Forum, who will have a, a role in drawing up Labour's policies for the next general election. Um, also, um, for my sins, I was a chair of governors, like most people in the Labour Party, you become a, a school governor at some point, I was a chair of governors for a, for a decade. And we live, of course, in an education city, effectively. We sit in, in one of the universities tonight. Um, we're a city which, in my view, is extremely divided in educational terms. At, at Hills Road, we have, of course, one of the, of the most successful schools, if you measure success in terms of, of access to the top universities in the country. Um, in the north of the city, we have one of the most challenged schools, whose head teacher, of course, only a few months ago famously said that many of his young people never get past the Grafton Centre. For those of you who don't know Cambridge very well, that means they don't get to see the, 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 um, the awe-inspiring centre of Cambridge where all the, the colleges and the University of Cambridge reside. Um, we also just had some county council elections where you might have thought that the role of the educational authority would loom large in those discussions. I have to say, sadly, it was barely raised at all in my experience, which tells us something perhaps about the democratic deficit that we have and perhaps the, the, the lack of, um, of concern, you might say, um, amongst the wider electorate or lack of understanding about what the possibilities might be. So I think um, we've got some very big educational challenges. That's before one even comes on to the performance of the, of the current government. And I'm delighted that we've got Fiona Miller with us tonight to take us through some of those challenges. And I think you've laid down some challenges, particularly to the Labour Party, about um, what might be put to the electorate in a couple of years' time. And I'll be very, very interested to hear what you're suggesting. I, doubt they'll, Thanks. I doubt they'll listen to me. Thank but you for being with us tonight. Anyway. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Daniel. And um, I'm very glad to hear a bit about the local context, actually, because I wasn't quite aware of that. I obviously know about Cambridge's higher education. But um, can I just ask how many people in the room are active in education, parents, governors, teachers? Or have been? So quite an expert audience then. Yeah? Good. Okay, well, um, because I mean, there's so much going on in education at the moment that I gave a talk the other day and some woman came up to me after and said it was absolutely fascinating, but I, you lost me about halfway through. I mean, you could talk for, for half an hour on just one area of, of the coalition's policies. I mean, like, I'd love to talk to you for half an hour about the threat of for-profit schools, for example, which is one of my current real fears about the Conservative being re-elected, not part of a coalition. Um, but, but I've been thinking a lot about, and I know this isn't only a Labour Party audience, but I've been thinking a lot about Labour policy and the, con you know, the context we're going to find ourselves in and trying to think of some con constructive ways forward rather than constantly moaning about what we did and didn't do in the past, which tends to be the kind of default position. I think that's partly because we don't have any very clear policies for schools yet. I mean, I know there is a plan to have policies for 2014. You probably know more about this than me if you're on the National Policy Forum. But there's nothing very constructive at the moment, and I feel now that people are, I think the electorate are, are, are holding back a bit from saying they'll support Labour enthusiastically because they don't quite know what we'd do if we won. Um, anyway, I mean, I obviously, I'm a governor, and a, I'm a parent, although my youngest child has recently uh, finished school. She's got, on a gap year going to university. And I became sort of politicised about education through being a governor, really, of a failing school in the, in the 1990s. It was one of the first schools to be inspected by Ofsted and was publicly named and shamed, and it was a disastrous experience. And it coincided with the introduction of the market in education. So we had this experience of you know, middle-class parents all moved out, we were left with empty places, other people came in, but a little group of parents stayed together. And we did turn the school around, it was a primary school, and it's now very, very successful. And I learnt a lot from that experience about education improvement but also about the community and what people can do when they come together to try and make things better in their community and I've been a governor ever since and I'm the chair of governors of the secondary school now so obviously I think education policy matters a lot and the reason I think it matters a lot is because I think, I think one of the best ways to judge a society is by its education system and when I talk to people I always ask these questions about our system I mean, do, do people feel it offers equal opportunities not just to higher education but to cultural experiences to enrichment, extracurricular activities does it divide young people and families or bring them together? Does it confirm existing privilege and deprivation? Offer more to those who already have a lot? Um, generally, I'd say the answer to those questions are no, but it's, they're not really easy questions to answer because 
Contrary to what you've, you read in the press, schools and comprehensive schools in particular have got a lot better in the last 50 years and they have opened, opened up opportunities for a lot of young people who didn't have them 50 years ago. I mean, that is just a fact. Don't believe the golden age theory because it's rubbish. I mean, in the late 1950s and the 60s, about you know, 9% of the population got five O levels and you know, 10% of the population went to university. It's much better now. But the problem is we still have this very steep hierarchy of schools. You know, we've got the private schools, the state-selected schools, faith schools, and the most successful of those are monopolised by the better-off children. They then monopolise the best universities. So it's still the case that a very small number of independent schools monopolise places at universities like Oxford and Cambridge. Um, so the rising tides, and I think the Labour government did an awful lot to help the tides rise in terms of schools, have lifted all the boats, but the gaps haven't really narrowed. Um, so children from different social and particular ethnic backgrounds um, you know, still not caught up with the more affluent children. Now, all the main political parties now name, claim that it is their mission to close the gaps and improve social mobility. I mean, nobody's arguing anything different, apart from possibly from UKIP, who want to bring back grammar schools. But generally, there's a sort of consensus about this. And that's absolutely right, because it is a, a, really a disgrace in this country that you know, where you were born, who your parents were, plays such a big part in where you end up in life. But the trouble is that all the main political parties have endorsed the hierarchy. I mean, nobody's really wanted to tackle that pre-existing hierarchy. And I can understand why they're a very powerful vested interest to take on, in the independent schools, particularly in the selective schools. Um, and it suits many families to be able to buy their children positional advantage in life. That's the trouble. And they're a very polit powerful political force. And also, there are massive inequalities in society, and I don't think you can talk about schools without looking at the underlying causes of why children underachieve, and it isn't only about what goes on in schools, and schools are expected to do an awful lot, but we need to look at income inequality, poverty, poor housing, support for parents. We've also still got a two-tier qualification system. Um, I'll talk a bit about that later on. You know, vocational and academic still has a very different status in this country, um, and, but primarily, both the parties have rather than tackle these things, have, prepared, have really wanted to superimpose the same tactics on top of that, which is more choice, more diversity, more competition, and more market forces, in the hope that the market will somehow right this inherently unfair situation. Um, so that's been the prevailing philosophy of the last 25 years. We've had new lots of new types of school, endless new types of schools, new governance arrangements, new admissions, admissions arrangements, different funding arrangements, and the tools of the market, like Ofsted and the League Tables. And in fact, this has led to more segregation between schools. I mean, we now have a more segregated school system than we did have 40 years ago when I was educated <coughs> in the London Education Authority. Um, and the added problem with education, actually, is that it's very, very difficult to have a rational public debate about it because the media is so incredibly biased. I mean, my friend and fellow campaigner, Melissa Benn, recently wrote a book about called School Wars, I mean, which she commented, and I think this is accurate, that state education has never commanded the same loyalty or affection as the NHS has, because mm -hmm. nearly everybody uses the NHS, but they don't really, or even the most powerful people in society rely on the NHS one way or another, but that's not true of education. And many senior journalists and commentators, and, we, and in fact, Melissa and I did an article for the New Statesman where we actually phoned all the editors and asked them where they sent their children to school, and those who were prepared to tell us, not surprisingly, also their children to private schools. They had no first-hand knowledge of any type at all of the state sector. Um, and so I think they've got a vested interest in talking down the system they've rejected for their own children. And I, mean, I don't know how many of you followed the story about the Michael Gove speech about children's historical knowledge yesterday, which I'm pleased to say was dug up by the local schools network, which I helped to found. But it turned out that Gove made a speech about, Michael Gove made a speech about children's historical knowledge, basing, basing it on several surveys, one of which turned out to be a survey done by the Premier Inn, which, in which they paid people to answer questions as a PR stunt. And that had been written up in the newspapers, so when his advisers came to wrote, write the speech, they just read what was in the newspapers. They didn't bother to look at the original surveys. And he then made this speech saying, most children don't know who Churchill is, when in fact, if you read the survey, it wasn't even a proper survey anyway, it was quite obvious that people were having a laugh with the questions. Anyway... So that gives you an indication of the level of public discourse about schools. Um, and I think on the other hand, and I go to a lot of schools, I talk to lots of head teachers of all different types of schools, and what I see is very, very hard-working people who really are trying their best but are being demonised by and large by the, in, the, in, the, in the media for, and, and unfortunately by the Secretary of State for not being very good, and that's just not true. So to be a bit more specific about where we are now, 
So the choice and diversity argument has reigned supreme since 1988, because that's when Mrs Thatcher said, brought in the idea of open enrolment, so any child could choose any school anywhere in the country. I mean, I could choose, live in London and choose a school in Cornwall if I wanted. I probably wouldn't get in, but in theory you could choose any school you wanted. And alongside of that, she, she created new types of autonomous schools. So we had the grant maintained schools, then the city technology colleges. And that was on top of existing diversity, because we've always, already, always had quite a diverse system in this country because of the 1944 settlement. So you already had faith schools, selective schools, community schools, voluntary aided schools. Labour then pursued this idea with the city academies that then became the academies. And then the coalition came and Michael Gove put rocket boosters under this whole thing with his 2010 Academy Conversion Act, which allows schools to convert rapidly to academy status by, by a single vote of the governing body. And some of you who are governors may have been through that process. Just to say a little bit about the conversion rate, because it's often said, oh, by the time of the next election, every school will be an academy. I mean, that's just not true, because their conver conversion rate is about 40 schools a month at the moment. So if we carry on at the current rate, there'll be about 4,000 academies. Still a lot in 2015, but that's only about a quarter of the schools in England. Um, so it's certainly not the vision that's being painted. And then you've got the free schools, which are academies by another name. They're being parachuted into communities by the DfE. Um, and all of these schools are wholly independent schools. They're not maintained schools. So they're funded via commercial contract with the Secretary of State. The funding doesn't come through the local authority. And that's, I think, potentially an explosively bad situation for us to be in. I'll explain why in a minute. So the consequence is that we've got a mishmash of academies and free schools, maintained schools, and chains of academy schools, which are basically sort of private providers, but they're charities. Um, there are serious concerns now, even from the Chief Inspector of Schools, Sir Michael Wilshaw, about who's going to hold schools to account, because it's clearly not feasible for the Secretary of State to manage 23,000 schools, which is the log logical conclusion of his policies. Uh, and these 4,000 that have converted are just, I think, a Trojan horse for full-on privatisation, because because they're contracted to the Secretary of State, it would be very easy for a future Conservative government just to change the procurement process and not contract them to charities, but to contract them to for-profit providers. And believe me, there are a lot of people waiting in the wings, and a lot of them are, t are, up, are forming academy chains already because they're waiting for the moment that they can, you know, they can go, go, come out and make a profit. The other thing is there's a massive centralisation of powers, and I notice you've been talking about you know, participation and democracy. I mean, this is actually not a movement for autonomy. It's a movement of putting power in the hands of the centre. So before 1988, the Secretary of State had three powers of direction over schools. The removal of wartime air raid shelters from school playgrounds, the determination of the numbers in teacher training and what they should be taught, and the approval of the opening and closure of schools and the size of the school building programme. So in 1988, with Thatcher's Big Education Act, he gained 250 powers. Now the Secretary of State, happens to be he at the moment, has 2,000 powers and growing. So the Secretary of State controls absolutely everything, the curriculum, qualifications, the planning of places, teacher training. It's a massive, massive power grab by government. So the, re the rhetoric of autonomy and localism is absolute rubbish. And the other problem is we're removing schools from the public realm because we're putting them into the hands of essentially private providers of one sort or another. Um, and so these large chains are often based a long way from the communities they serve. They have exempt charity status, so you can't see their accounts on the Charity Commission website. Um, they also take a percentage of their school's funding. So when you hear politicians say it's marvellous because we're devolving all the funding down to schools, if they're in a chain, the chain then takes a percentage in the way that the local authority has traditionally done. So they're quite wealthy organisations because if you can imagine, you've got you know, 50, 60 schools and you're taking 5%, 6% of their budget. So some of the chief executives of the academy chains are earning £250,000, £300,000 a year, more than local authority chief executives would. Um, so they're basically privatised local authorities, and their results are very mixed. The local schools network, which I helped to set up, has done an analysis of... One of the very good things the government has done is it's put all the data about schools into the public domain so you can analyse the results. We've analysed all the results of academies, maintained schools, free schools, and in fact... They're no different. I mean, they've improved. The, the ones that were in very poor areas have improved very quickly, but serve the maintained schools in very poor areas because there was a big focus on school improvement under the last Labour government, and, that, and a lot of it worked. Um, they've also got varied governance arrangements. That means the different admissions arrangements, different ways of dealing with SEN children, the rights of parents. So there's a massive inequality now across the country. Alongside that, you've got Michael Gove's changes to the curriculum and qualifications. So you've got a narrowing of the curriculum. It's quite prescriptive and these changes to primarily exam-based assessment. So coursework's going, modules going, everything will be in terminal exams, 
you know, A2, AS doesn't count anymore for A2s. There's this very, it's all based on the EBAC subjects, and there's not very much interest really in vocational qualifications. This again is all determined from the centre, and then you've got a very unpleasant beast called the Forced Academy, which is when a school falls below the floor targets or fails its offer report, the Secretary of State can move in and take it over and hand it over to one of these privatised chains. And that's causing a lot of distress. I don't know if it's happening in this area, but it's certainly happening in lots of parts of London, um, against the wishes of the parents. And that seems to be not a very good thing to do, because if we want parents to have power, we should enable them to be part of the process of deciding who runs their schools. And it's very odd, isn't it, that we're giving free schools to parents who've got no track record at all in education, but we're not allowing parents of existing schools to have a say who should run, over, who should run their schools in the future. So, is there another way? Well, what would it look like? So I think the problems for the left, or for Labour now, I don't know what the Liberal Democrats' policies are really, but there are two. One is the pragmatic one of how you deal with this legacy of the last 25 years, and that's complicated enough. But the second one is, you know, what is the big vision? I mean, we don't really have a big alternative vision to this one of this market, marketised gradual centralisation. And I think the two are inter interrelated, because you can't move to the big vision without going through this awful dealing with the legacy process and one of the issues at the moment is that the school workforce is very demoralised and you know what people are saying is for God's sake don't put more change on us now because we get you know you hear the curriculum is being changed every year the exams are being changed every year so I think it will be quite diff difficult for a new government to come in and say look we're just going to throw it all up in the air again and start all over so I think we need to be sort of You've got to have the big vision there. We've got to have a plan how we get to the, how we get there without causing too much disruption. So I would, if I were Secretary of State for Education, I would make the big vision about quality and equality because I think that's really what parents want, what most people want. I'd look at Finland. You probably know about Finland, the most successful school system in the world, which is very, very high standards and narrows the gap. So it's got high equity and uh, good results. Uh, and the Finnish revolution actually started with the abolition of selection in private schools about 40 years ago. They took a big decision that that's what they would have to do if they were going to get the sort of system they wanted. So we could end the 11 plus and we, could, we, couldn't, we couldn't abolish private schools. I don't quite understand how they did that. But you could do, there's lots you could do with charitable status and I'm happy to take some questions about that afterwards. Um, so then, then, then I think it's about investment and implementation. So the, the early years are incredibly important. Don't talk about that nearly enough. Labour did great things, sure start, the children's centres. We don't celebrate our record. That's one of the other problems, I think, in our... Um, and everybody knows that you, make, you can investment in the early years, you know, save a lot of money later on. Excellent neighbourhood, comprehensive schools and teachers. I mean, we must stick to the idea of rigour, good teaching and leadership, but also with strong links to the wider community and I think family interventions because, as I said earlier, I don't think schools can do it all. You've got to have other, other resources there to support children who are struggling. Um, I would like to see state schools being funded at the level of independent schools. I mean, I know it's like painting the fourth road bridge because you fund them to that level and the independent schools would charge more. But it seems to me quite a good principle. I don't think you can argue that there's inequality when one lot of schools has so much more money than another lot of schools. Um, and then I would, um, I think to guarantee excellence given the rapid fragmentation that we're going to see around the country, I think you've got to put a fair regulatory structure around all schools. So one thing that people ask me a lot is, you know, can we bring the academies back into make the maintained sector and can we shut down free schools? I think that is not a real realistic option, quite apart from anything else. It would be incredibly time consuming to do it. So what we'd have to try and do is put a structure around all schools so it didn't matter what type of school they were. Everybody would be funded fairly and they'd have to abide by the same rules. So if a freedom is worth having, it give it to every school. At the moment it seems ridiculous we're being consulted on a new national curriculum which you know, 4,000 schools in the country won't have to do. If it's right to have a national curriculum, then everybody should do it. If it's wrong to have one, then don't give it to anybody. And then there are minor issues, which, you know, Stephen Twigg talks about a lot, like <coughs> nutritional standards in schools. If it's right to have high nutritional standards, then let everybody do it. Don't say academies don't have to have them. So I think, you know, let's, let's, make, it, let's make it a level playing field, and it won't matter if these schools are free schools or academies, because they'll all have to do the same thing. Um, and I would definitely give, I think there is a role for the local authority and it, and it d distresses me to hear how local authorities are also demonised because there are some very good local authorities doing a very good job. Um, and they must have a role for things like admissions, for special educational needs, for the care of the most vulnerable and excluded children. And then I think we, you know, we've got to think about how we do devolve power back from the centre to, to the local level. And I think that's going to be very difficult because politicians, I've noticed in my time, watching them from outside being part of the political process, because I worked at number 10 for six years, they just love acquiring power. And they think only they can control everything. But actually, 
If you look at the rise in standards, which, I mean, standards in schools have gone up, but it's been very, very incremental. And I don't think you could, you probably could argue that the investment hasn't made the difference it could have made. There must be smarter ways, and we will have to find smarter ways of doing more for less, because there isn't going to be very much money around in the next few years. Now, another idea that's floating around at the moment is about school boards. So rather than give the powers to the local authorities, you have another kind of middle tier, which is elected governors, parents, members of the local community, and local councillors. I'd be interested to hear what people think about that. I mean, I know some local authorities would say, we've already got a middle tier, it's called local government. We don't need anything else. But I think if you want to engage parents in the community, we've got to think about new ways of doing that. Personally, I would go for much more collaboration and school-to-school -school support. So I would say that we want to move away from this market model <coughs> and look at local accountability and encourage people to work together, schools, professionals, to improve schools that way, you know, sharing their expertise and so on. And the strong would support the weak. And it, to a certain extent, that's happening. And one of the byproducts of the push for academies is that local, lots of local authorities who've been sort of cast out on their own, where, I mean, Tory authorities have literally said to all their schools, go, you know, we don't want you anymore, become academies. They forced them all out, and now they're reorganising themselves in little clusters to, to collaborate and find some sort of community, because I think it's just basic human nature. I don't think people want to be alone. I don't think institutions want to be alone. I think people will gravitate towards each other in that sort of situation, and that's a better philosophy for us. Um, and you can have autonomy within that. I mean, somebody described it. I mean, it was actually ahead of one of a school in Cambridgeshire, not far from here, the Impington College, possibly. Yeah. Uh, he's a runner, and he said it'd be like being in the, Eng in the UK Olympics team. You know, we're all sort of competing with each other, but we want the same goal for our schools together. I think that's a very good analogy. And there's things like the London Challenge. I don't know how many of you are aware of that, where... It's a great labour initiative. Really, London has the most successful schools in the country now, and that was because of a you know, collaborative approach to education and people sharing expertise and good practice. And I, I use the examples of Camden and Hackney because I live in Camden where we have no academies. We have one new academy that's just opened this year with no conversions at all. Everybody's stuck with the local authority, even if they're voluntary-aided or maintained schools. And we've got nearly every school in Camden is good or outstanding. Got the best record in the country for primary schools. Hackney, meanwhile, went hell for leather for the academy model and has a very, had a very sim similar outcome. They decided that was the right thing for them. But both authorities have a strong local authority presence and they've both done more or less the same thing. So there is no one right way to do it. And I think we've got to w get away from this idea that, you know, academies and independent schools good, maintains community schools bad, because it's just not true. And it's insulting also for the people who work in the other schools and parents in them and so on. So finally... What do we mean by good education? I mean, the real question is what goes on in that school? What's taught, how we decide what it, whether it's good, and what's the outcome we want? And I always like to use Professor Richard Pring's question when he did the Nuffield Review into 14 to 19 education. He started every session and paper off with what makes an educated 19-year-old. And it's a very interesting question, actually. And once you start asking people that, and I did a piece of research with parents a couple of years ago when we went around the country talking to them and did a poll and I added that question onto the end of everything I did, every focus group and it was fascinating the response you came back with because I mean qualifications mattered academic qualifications mattered and maths and English particularly mattered but they all talked about so many other things they wanted their 19 year old children to have and to be they wanted them to be they wanted them to have finan financial good sense know about their good health they wanted yeah. to know about relationships I mean how to look after themselves, how to cook. Everybody said they wanted their children to know how to cook. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's, you know, I think it's complicated, but I'm just, I think it's evidence that it, people out there feel there is more to education about becoming a human being than simply getting a string of exams. And in fact, the CBI recently called our education system a conveyor belt of exams and came up with some very radical solutions that they wanted to see. So it's not just mad lefties like me talking about it. Um, so what would I think the radical alternative would be a big vision that had the development and well-being of all children at its heart and rigorous and inclusive qualifications and a curriculum that was... So, of course, every child should be highly literate and numerate and everybody should have access to academic subjects if they want to do them. And I do deplore in a way that Labour's focus on the performance um, tables did mean a lot of schools c converted very quickly to some vocational qualifications that really weren't worth very much and away from the core academic curriculum. But I think GOES going too far in the other direction now because there, for some students it's just not the right approach. You need to be able to offer a broad curriculum to everyone. I think exams at 16 are completely irrelevant now. If everybody's going to have to stay on until they're 18, which is 
it's what's happening from next year, we should be moving towards a final qualification at 18, which measures academic and vocational achievement. And I think an accountability system alongside that, that isn't just based on exams, but looks at creative arts, practical, technical education, personal development and citizenship, and I think allows education to become a more stimulating, liberating process than it is at the moment. I mean, I just think it's, it is a conveyor belt for the kids who are on it, and it's very, very stressful. Now, the Tories will press will be waiting, of course, with accusations of dumbing down, but I think we can turn the tables on that, because, I mean, Michael Gove says our qualification systems don't match the best in the developed world, but if you look at the developed world, by and large, they don't do high-stakes testing at 16. They have a final qualification at 18. Um, so there are you know, respected qualifications like the International Baccalaureate, um, and nobody accuses the IB, IB of dumbing down, but if you look at the IB sort of you know, basic values, it boasts of promoting the education of the whole person, emphasising intellectual, personal, emotional and social growth. That's a big part of it. And the IB includes lots of different forms of assessment that aren't just exam-based, and I think we could learn a lot from that. And I think there are lessons to be drawn from Mike Tomlinson's uh, proposed diploma from 2004 which was sort of tossed aside at the time by the Labour government but it would have been quite a good blueprint and actually if we'd adopted the Mike Tomlinson proposal it was going to take 10 years to implement so we'd have been starting to Im implement it next year and then we, maybe we wouldn't have been having this discussion here tonight, maybe we'd be thinking that we had got something better that you know, didn't make some children fa feel like failures at 16 which I think our system does um, so I think there is a convergence to sum up between our, a sort of progressive bigger vision and what parents want. I, I, ex I understand that there's great anxiety about trying to communicate this to the wider world because of this argument. I think it's a lot to do with the media, to be perfectly honest, because I think if you go over the media's heads and talk to parents and talk to schools, a lot of people would get it very quickly. But, you know, that instant reaction, the dumbing down, the lack of rigour, the... But what's so fascinating about the Gove reforms is a lot of the very, very prestigious and high-performing independent schools have come out against them because they feel they're too narrow. So this is an odd sort of coalition developing now about the direction of travel. So I think the time has come for somebody to make a very bold and alternative argument. Um, and I'm just going to finish up with a quote from Robin Pedley, who was one of the pioneers of comprehensive education, who said that comprehensive education does more than open the doors of opportunity to all children it represents a different, a larger, and a more generous attitude of mind, the forging of a communal culture by the pursuit of quality with equality. And I think that's a very good philosophy, and we should have that at the heart of whatever we do next. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Fiona. Lots to think about there. Now, in a very Fabian kind of way, I've been asked to say to you, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a short break for a few minutes where you're going to talk possibly to your neighbour or somebody else you want to talk to, to um, come up with some thoughts to, to feed back to Fiona, who will then respond. So it's um, get my pen out. just before 8 o'clock. So if we say we'll, we'll restart at 10 past 8, that isn't an excuse to go and wander around the building. <laughs> Stay you where you are. Talk, yeah, you can go to the loo, that's allowed. But um, if, you can, if, if you really don't want to talk to your neighbour, that's OK. You can, you can develop your own thoughts in the meantime. But at 10 past 8, we'll resume, and I'll take two or three contributions, and we'll do it in the in the usual manner. Okay, yeah. thanks. Should we talk to each other? We can talk to each other. Tell me a bit more about So interesting, you're not going to take five minutes of me, so I'm going to stop you. I'm going to be very um, dictatorial. Still doesn't work. Can you whistle that? Be quiet. Right. Very good. Sorry, rude works. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do is, um, perhaps if you can just um, indicate um, who would like to um, make the first contributions. I'll take three. We'll make sure we get everybody in. We're going to finish at nine, so I'll keep you on time. So please indicate who would like to come in first. Very good. Over here. Um, you talked about children staying on until they're 18. Um, I just wondered what's going to happen to the children who would normally be leaving at 16 and taking jobs or vocational training of some kind who are not academic, what are they going to be doing for those two years? How are the schools going to pick them? What, what plans are there? Let's take three. Jocelyn? Um, we were concerned about Shore Start because uh, my colleague here, Elizabeth, had read some research that said one of the problems was that middle class families, middle class children, gained the greatest benefit from that program. And if that was so, 
how do we make sure that children who come from more deprived backgrounds, who really should be getting access to, to, to that sort of a program, can actually know that the program exists, can get access to it? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the third one for starters here. Well, various things. You're talking about um, smarter ways of narrowing the gap. Um, Cambridgeshire has a shocking record mm. on that, narrowing the gap. Absolutely shocking. Um, now, I'm a governor, and we, we actually are thinking very hard about how you use the pupil premium. I think the pupil premium, um, because you have to report on it and think mm. seriously about it, I think it's actually having a beneficial effect. Mm -hmm. It's very thought provoking about how you're going to use it. And for the Labour Party, I would very much want you to go back to every child matters. Mm -hmm. Um, because I thought that was, you know, that was excellent. Mm -hmm. um, we've gone a long way. Quite a few there okay. to start with. Well, they're all sort of tied up in a way. Um, on the raising the school leaving age, I mean, it's participation in education and training. So you don't have to be in a school, although it's a bit of a grey area, this, because I think a lot of people don't realise that there's schools will continue, to, even if they've left your school, you'll be responsible for them for the next two years. So you, wherever they end up, if they then go somewhere else until they're 17 and then drop out, it will be your responsibility. Quite how that's going to be reported to the outside world, I don't know. Who's responsible? There's the school that they left. But well, that doesn't make sense. No, well, it doesn't, but then <laughs> that's how it goes. Yeah. But then if, you can't, if, if Labour is elected, then yeah. surely you'll have to deal with it. Well, it was a Labour policy in the first place, which the coalition decided to carry on. But, I mean, I think if there are good alternative provision for those students, and they are a significant minority who need to be catered for, it should be all right. The problem is, in a lot of areas, there, aren't good alternative, there isn't good alternative provision, because we've never really done... I mean, they're very, very oversubscribed. Apprenticeships are impossible to get on. But we've just never done a vocational, practical, technical education very well why, in this country. Why why well, initiate it? Why, in, it? why make it absolutely mandatory for them to, to be in education until they're 18? Because there was a terrible problem with young people, 13% not in employment, education and training between mm. 17 and 19, and I think that was one way of dealing with it. And I think in principle it's a good idea. I think you need to get the accountability measures right and make sure that there is alternative provision available or that schools can offer alternative provision themselves. But, you know, the funding issue at the moment, and it's interesting because the pupil premium money doesn't apply. I mean, I'm not sure does it apply 16 to 18. It, that could apply. To, that could be invested in those sorts of schemes. But it hasn't been very well thought through. That is definitely true. That's definitely true. Um, so watch this space, I think. Once schools start to recognise that in one of these many metrics in the performance tables there will be a column to say how many of your students are not in employment, education and training you think you know, you've lost them a year ago you're still responsible for them it might focus schools' minds on providing alternative qualifications for those students which I'm sure is the intention um, on the Sure Start question yeah I mean I know about that it was, one, it was the first evaluation of Sure Start um, and it is a worry in a way although I think that one of the great things about Sure Start is that everybody uses it because I've always, I, I mean, I used to chair a charity called the Family and Parenting Institute. We did a lot of research on par parent interventions. And one of the problems with parent interventions, if you make them sort of um, the de a deficit model, so only the most needy parents have them, they get a stigma attached to them. Mm -hmm. And well, a lot of people. No, no, no. But I think, so the idea of Sure Start was it would be open to all. And that seems to me a very good. Thing, and I would want to stick with that idea because I think bringing people together generally is a good idea and places where people from all backgrounds go and meet. The problem is going to be is finding the, the, the most disadvantaged and hard to reach families and luring them in. In fact one of the good things that Labour did which is sort of dubbed by the media as the baby ASBO was that they started something called the Nurse Family Partnerships where <laughs> children would get identified before they were born as being potentially children who needed interventions later on because of the social circumstances of the mother and they would be, a, they would be a, allocated a nurse to work with the family from that stage from the moment the child was born because of course even the first six weeks is incredibly important and mother-baby interactions so I think if we carried on with those sorts of policies which takes me on to your question about every child matters because the whole point of every child matters was to for all things to matter and for it to start from 0 to 5 and I think we need to go back to that as well and try and get these very very early interventions 
identify the families who need support and then get them into Shorestar and get them into good nursery provision. I mean, the coalition has got nursery provision now for two-year-olds, hasn't it, and disadvantaged two-year-olds, mm-hmm. which we didn't do, and I think we should do more to that because the problem with the children's centres was they were effe- effectively a business model. If you wanted to run a children's centre, you have to charge fees for, for daycare, and you know they were quite expensive, so they were beyond the reach of a lot of the poorest families, so they weren't using the children's centres for that reason. There were very few free places for vulnerable families. But that's a big political argument about funding free round-the-clock early years provision for, for, for children who would be better in some sort of early years setting from eight to five than they might be at home. And unfortunately, there are children for whom that is a better environment. Actually, can I just say there is in Cambridge a recognition of that issue because there are children's centres for children between three and five, and if they're depri- in a de- more deprived area or family, it's two to five. Well, that's so excellent. That has been recognised. That's excellent, and that's really what that, I mean. That's really we need to start thinking about that early intervention because I mean, there's so much of the evidence shows if you start to narrow the gaps, then it becomes much easier later on. I mean, I, <coughs> I agree with you about the people premium. I think in some areas it's been used to sort of fund a bit of a funding gap, to plug a bit of a gap. But you're right, the accountability, and I've just been through an offset under the new framework in the school where I'm the chair of governors. And we were, it was October, so it was literally six weeks after they'd said, and you're all going to be asked how you spend the pupil premium. So we'd barely started to spend it, but we had, we had got some quite good data on things we hadn't had done. It does make you focus your mind. And just a little tip if you're going through offset, we'd actually tried an intervention that hadn't worked, and we'd abandoned it because it didn't work. So we'd evaluated it and abandoned it, so they thought that was absolutely marvellous. So we proved that we were, decide- we were really looking at how we were spending the pupil premium money. Um, so that's the, you know, that is a, form of, a good form of accountability, I think. And there is this Sutton Trust pupil premium toolkit for the real techies. Do you know about that? Which tells you how many extra months of achievement you get for every pound you spend. So. <laughs> and some of the things, interestingly, that politicians talk about endlessly, namely streaming and uniforms, have zero benefit. Also, big question marks about teaching assistants. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, the one thing that was really is really effective is one-to-one tuition, more, to, more you know, more personal intervention with the students. Yeah. But on that point, you didn't mention class size, <coughs> and I would have thought that the teaching assistant has a yeah. beneficial effect. Depends what they're doing. I think. I think in a lot of schools, they're maybe not trained at doing the right things. The class size. There's not that much evidence about class size actually having an impact on outcomes. It's very, very popular with parents, but the evidence doesn't quite stack up, unfortunately. I recall and, we're, and we're stuck with the class size policy is a real millstone around a lot of schools and local authorities next now, because where there is sh- a shortage of places, I mean, I think there isn't in some parts of East Anglia, judging from what I read about the new free schools that are being set up, but in London there's a massive shortage of places, and schools cannot put one or two extra children in a primary school class because of the class size policy. So you've got to then create another class and employ another teacher, which is very expensive at the moment. So there probably ought to be a bit more flexibility about that. And there are a lot of parents in London who have no school at all for their children, which is terrible. Big problem here too, but anyway. Um, in, in the city? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's partly demographics. So, at the back? Um, to ask a question now? Sure, yeah. It, well, it, I, I've been listening to this and I'm... And I'll be discussing it with my colleague. Do you mind if I, I'm, going to make, I'm going to ask this question that we we, we evolve. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've been talking about a move from a well-being agenda to an economically competitive mm. agenda. We're talking about mm. conflicts of interest. We're yeah. talking about outright deception on the part of the authorities. We're talking about well-connected families being able to afford to get the nurses <coughs> advantage. We're talking about the <coughs> being able to pay to get themselves located. Mm. You can see where I'm going with this. How much of an exaggeration do you think would it be to refer to this as in some senses a war? Mm. Um, I mean, I'm using that slightly facetiously, and I think Mm. we've got to be very careful about the language. But but just for the purposes of discussion, let's think that it is a war. Mm. Because there are conflicts of interest, and there will be winners, and there will be Mm. losers, unless something is done about what happens now. There's no question about that. Mm. So the question is, if it's a war, is it winnable? Well, 
I think it's winnable with a very, very different approach, but that we're so far removed from that approach now that I don't really quite know how we get back there. I mean, it's interesting, David Willits talks about the parental arms race, and I think it's a great expression. He, that's what we, we're in. We're in a parental arms race, because the, one of the side effects of the market and the competition is to make parents more and more anxious about them not getting the right thing for their children. If they don't get the right thing for their children, they might fail, they might not get the job into the university, they might not get the job they want. I mean, I see epic levels of parental anxiety in London. Like, no, nothing like when my children were young. And everybody's in competition with everybody else's children. You know, there are schools in London where the parents are banned from the premises because they're going through other children's book bags. Like, this is in primary school to see what <laughs> reading levels, seriously, what reading levels they're at. And it's, we've just got it all the wrong way around. Now, it's true that competition has helped to drive up standards to a certain extent. But so have a lot of other things as well. We should be focusing on the other things. And it's funny because I didn't mention the thing about the economic agenda. because, I, In fact, that is very important. It's very important that we're competing in a global economy and we want people to have jobs and therefore we need to be able to compete with people in other countries. I mean, I accept that that's true. But I don't think you have to sacrifice all these other things in order to get well-rounded young people who can perform and function for the economy. Although, I mean, I don't like all these comparisons with the Far East because, I mean, the sort of levels of stress that children in schools in the Far East have to get them there. They're at school all day and they go to tutors all night. They're having nervous breakdowns and committing suicide. And if you look at the evidence from America, which is considered too laid back a system, you know, all the innovation, I mean, they're, they're, they're very good cogs in the machine, a lot of these works in the Far East, but in America, all the innovation is coming from America because it's still a, 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 an education system basically based on a sort of liberal arts curriculum. And, and not, I mean, they're introducing testing now, but it isn't that rigorous in that sense in the way that our, our system is. But the fact is, the, the market has not delivered for the, the, I'm not even sure it's delivered for the better off children, but it has not delivered for the poorest children. It hasn't, all the boats haven't risen. And I think we need to look at a different approach now, which would be more collaborative and focusing on what, what a real education consists of. Because well, even, the, even the CBI and the the business leaders say that you know, they get these well-qualified individuals, but they haven't got the social skills, they haven't got the resilience, they don't know how to team build, they haven't got initiative. And that's because it's driven out of them at school, because all they're doing is cramming themselves for exams. But I think these are difficult and big arguments to make, but I think it is a bit of a war. We're setting everybody against everybody else. Schools are competing with each other, parents are com competing with each other, kids are competing with each other. It's just all the wrong way around. Stuart and then Kimo. Yeah, I, I, we, we were talking about um, another aspect of the way in which intense competition um, <coughs> distorts the whole process and that's in schools where the heads and the staff are constrained to turn out good results so that they look as though they're doing well and it, you know, this happens in several ways the way in which SATs the, sort of thing, mm -hmm. the process of assessment has become the starting of uh, examination of life for all the kids and um, at GCSE and A level um, I, I know from my personal experience of schools where they, they refuse to enter some children in for exams because they actually spoil the, um, the percentage results from the exams and this is a normal process, it's bound to happen if your school is being judged in this way, in this competitive way, you're going to maximise your results and you'll fiddle and you'll cheat and lots of them do. Um, well, that's so I, I'm very taken by your idea of um, a more collaborative approach, but what, how you set that, <coughs> I really don't know. Okay. Okay, it's, uh, it's about 40 years since comprehensivisation and we still have grammar schools mm. in parts of the country which no one's dared to touch, yeah. government's all queues. Uh, now we're in a situation where we have not only grammar schools, we have academies, we have faith schools, mm. we have free schools. Mm. Uh, the logic of your argument surely is that for everyone to have the same opportunities, all schools should be what someone called bog standard comprehensives. Mm. Um, surely you can't do anything else. Yeah, the, other I agree. That, the, the other thing that concerns We're still arguing about it, isn't it? No. <laughs> We've been arguing 40 years yeah. on yeah. Why wouldn't they do it? What's the problem with doing something about it? And the other thing that worries me is that um, I don't, teachers can't afford to live in Cambridge on the mm. teacher's salary. 
you know, I know that they either have to have a rich spouse or they just have a long way away in computer day. And it's not a salary that encourages anyone to aspire to be a teacher. Mm. Um, and that's something that's declined in the last 100 years. So 100 mm. years ago, it was an honour mm. to be a school mm. teacher. Now, you mm. can't do anything else from a teacher mm. without being rude about it. Yeah. Uh, but surely teacher salary is something that I'm really worried about. Yeah. Well, actually, I was going to... I was go- was there only two questions there? There's two. Because yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to come back to the issue of I didn't mention performance related pay, which is of course one of the other new reforms that's about to hit us. Um, and the performance related pay argument is quite interesting because that it, it just I've read all the research into perform, performance related pay in schools and there is no evidence that it works. So it must be about paving the way for privatisation, I think, because they want to have reg- you know, it would lead to regional pay and you know, schools could drive salaries down. Um, but the problem with performance related pay is it will be linked to exam and test results, inevitably, which is very hard to do in a collaborative team environment, isn't it? Um, and in the, what you see in America now is, you know, heads going to court and being prosecuted for falsifying test results because their pay was based on... So I think that's something we really must resist. If our governing body discussed it last week, that's confidential, by the way, but I mean, I think we're hoping to negotiate a local authority-wide arrangement with the unions where we'll, you know, in build a bit of flexibility but not go the whole way, which is what the Secretary of State wants. Um, so, and I think that you know, teacher pay is a problem. If you look at Finland, one of the other things they did was they just invested incredibly heavily in their teacher mm-hmm. workforce. You know, teachers are taught, they go to university for four years and they're taught how to design the curriculum. So they don't need the Secretary of State to come in and do it for them because mm-hmm. they know how to do that. So it needs to be a... I'm not even sure that it's, almost, it's about money. I mean, I appreciate the cost of living part, but I think teachers and other professionals aren't necessarily motivated by money. They are motivated by professional autonomy and... You know, being given responsibility and being valued and I think if we get, gave our teachers more auto- real autonomy rather than saying they've got autonomy when in fact they haven't I think you would attract more people in. But at some point when you decide what you're going to do with your life you sit down and think yeah. you know you do worry about money you know, just kind yes of but I mean, money, if, you know? I mean it's interesting I mean the, one of the products of the recession is a lot of people are looking at teaching now so graduates are mm. looking at teaching now yes. so, so things like teach first and massively and massively oversubscribe um, Sats disaster, really, aren't they? I read the story in the paper the other day about the head teacher who told the parent that they, she should cancel her daughter's birthday party because it was a Saturday before the Sats test, and she didn't want the children to be tired when they came to do that. It's got a bit out of control. But the problem is that the whole, just to go back to my argument about the market, is the whole accountability measure is the cart wagging, you know, driving the horse. So everybody adjusts their behaviour to try and meet the accountability measures. So if the accountability measures say it's the SATS test, then birthday parties have to be cancelled. You know, if it's the GCSE results, then obviously you're not going to put in the kids who aren't going to get a C grade. But they are changing the performance measures. I don't know how, how many people know this. There's going to be a new set of measures. One is going to be A to C grades without only in maths and English. One is going to be points in the best eight subjects, which will include the English baccalaureate subjects and three others. And the other one is going to be a value-added measure in the best eight subjects. So that's quite a good thing, because it will focus on progress. But the schools will have to be doing, have a lot of students doing the English baccalaureate subjects to get into that kind of measure in the first place. And then it goes back to your issue about admissions. We don't have a comprehensive system. We have comprehensive schools that aren't really comprehensive schools, they're really secondary modern schools, and we have secondary modern schools that really are secondary modern schools because they still have grammar schools alongside them. So those schools will still never really be able to compete with the schools that have the highly academic intakes, and it's unfair. And there'll be new perverse incentives in that new system, one way or another. Why haven't we got rid of the grammars? It's a very good question, because when we had (coughs) a majority of 160 plus, we could have done it very easily. But there was a little by-election in Wirral in 1996, and the then leader of the opposition, Tony Blair, went there and grammar schools were an issue and he said Labour won't get rid of grammar schools. So that was that. But it could, it could still be done. I've written a pamphlet about how you could do it over ten years without affecting any child that's currently in an existing grammar school. You could just phase it out so gradually that it would barely be noticed. Um, but then you'd have to cope with the Daily Mail. And that's and the other two problem. electoral cycles. Yeah. <laughs> you'd have to cope with the Daily Mail as well. That's the other problem. But I'm still hopeful that somebody will grasp the metal on that one. Because it affects, it affects 25% of all education authority selection, still. And it has massive effects on s- surrounding areas. So if you go to, you know, you live in East Sussex, you're affected by the grammar schools in Kent. The, the uh, education authorities, authorities in South London are affected by the, the Bromley grammars and the Kent grammars. 
and there are, there are advertisements on the back of a London bus now you get a lot of information from the back of London buses about schools actually because everybody advertises free schools advertise parenting interventions advertises and ad- there's an advertisement now for a grammar school stream in a comprehensive school so if you come to our school your child can get into the grammar school stream and that's a South London comprehensive that's having to cope with the flight out to the Cambridge Grammar School. So Mark, let's go. I want to bring us back to <coughs> economics, mm. um, thinking about you know, the Labour government carrying on with some of the austerity mm. measures that we've got now and the effect that that would have on resourcing education. Mm. So I'm just wondering what thoughts you have. Because I'm also thinking that we would... The issue of diversity is not such a problem, as you say, if you're actually thinking about quality and equality, but to actually get that equality and quality, Mm. what are the resourcing issues for schools Mm. in the next 10 years? Mm. Okay, well, there's a very big problem with capital investment in schools, I'd say, which isn't talked about enough at the moment. Um, You know, the coalition cancelled building schools for the future, and they also cancelled the devolved capital that went to schools to do their own investment. Now, people say school buildings don't matter, but I've looked at the Eden website and I've noticed that the buildings seem to matter. They've got a very nice drawing school, they've got a music school, they've got a drama school, they've got cinemas. So I think we should aspire for the poorest children what the, so the same things that the richest children get. And I, mean, I think you can teach in the mud hut, there's no doubt at all, and do a brilliant job. But I think children who come from poor backgrounds deserve to go to wonderful, have wonderful facilities and premises and I think it lifts their self esteem so that would be the first thing I think I would, I th- and I think it would be in, you know, that would create jobs, there's no doubt about it investment in capital programs. I think on the revenue side it is complicated and that may be somewhere where more school to school collaboration could help the sharing of resources, one problem with the arms race is that everybody's looking after their own little resources but you could be sharing teachers or curriculum subjects. I think that, that's a, something that needs to be looked at very imaginatively. I think investment probably should go into the early years, but I think you'll find the secondary schools will be a very powerful lobby, and particularly the sixth forms at the moment, whose funding is being cut dramatically. And then, you know, so we're, we're putting the investment at the wrong end, in, in a sense. Um, what other things could Labour do? And, and, but I think the crucial thing is the quality of teaching. So I really would put all the money investment in teaching. And it's not just about initial teacher training, which everybody focuses, it's on how you continue to develop teachers once they're working. So, every, you know, continuous professional development, good opportunities to get better at what you do. And that's what's going to make the biggest difference in terms of outcomes, not all these endless structural changes, which really have done very, very little over time. What really has made a difference is, is when the leadership and the teaching in the school is good, and that's where we should be putting our money, I think. <coughs> Who's next? Well, while you're thinking, you mentioned charitable status earlier. Yeah. And it does seem to me that still the really, really big divide is with the private schools. Yeah. And um, it probably is always going to be too hard for Labour to tackle, <coughs> although I think personally we should try. Yeah. Um, and, of course, an awful lot of time was spent going around this, um, <coughs> this labyrinth of charitable status in the last parliament. Should we go yeah. there again? I think so, because it's very difficult to... I mean, people say we must abolish charitable status. It's actually quite difficult to do because some of these schools, take Eton, for example, have been charities since the 14th century. And they've got fantastically complicated arrangements with endowments and property. and It would be very difficult to unravel all of that. But, and, and also, the education is a charitable purpose under the Charities Act and has been for a very, very long time. So the private schools argue that they are charities because they're providing education. The question is, what sort of education and to who do they have to provide to, to justify having charitable status? And I think that's where, in 2004, when the last Charities Commission uh, Act was passed, and I think Ed Miliband was the minister who was responsible for it, there was an opportunity to set the bar much higher in the legislation. They didn't do that. They passed the ball back to the Charities Commission, who then had to define what public benefit meant in ter- terms of education. So they come up with their definition. I don't know, this is really technical stuff. They were then challenged by the independent schools in the High Court, and the High Court ruled basically in favour of the independent schools, surprisingly. <laughs> so they don't, now they don't have to really do very much. And I think we should raise the bar and say, in order to justify your charitable status, you have to do something that benefits you know, and is measure, in a measurable way, your local community of schools. I would, I would put them as part of the local community of schools. 
and see what they could do. So instead of offering bursaries to the brightest children, which is their way of dealing with, ch- with charitable status, which doesn't help the other schools at all, they should have to take in the children who are at risk of exclusion and the hardest to teach and would benefit from the small class sizes. I think they should open up their facilities and they should be sharing their teachers. So I think, I think that's how I would deal with it. I don't think you're going to, you can't abolish independent schools and you probably can't abolish charitable status very easily, but you could make it very, very hard to earn it. And you I think could also have a, a, a good charity commission. <coughs> and that's one of those little places where um, there's never any real attempt to make it into a radical institution. Mm. I mean, Susie Leather was the chair at one stage, and she was very good. But they faced her down. Yeah, they did. It was really? extraordinary. And over this issue. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to go. And she was a parent in a, uh, two children in a private school. She was great. She really tried to take it on, but they weren't having it. Yeah. No, she was a great person. Mm. Or still is. Mm. Right. But um, I read in the Evening Standard that you were in the running to be <laughs> the Labour candidate Hampson for Kilburn. Um, Hampstead and Kilburn. Mm. But you had turned it down, or you weren't going to go ahead with yeah. it because you thought you could be more effective outside the mm. Labour Party than inside it. I just wonder if you would talk us through that sort of idea that it could be more effective. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought about it a lot, and if there was anywhere I wanted to be an MP, it would be Hampstead and Kilburn, because I've lived there all my life, and it's a great seat, and we, ne- we need to win it to win the next election, because it's got a majority of 42, so it's, it wouldn't be, I mean, it would be a quite a daunting prospect. But I'm still a bit confused about what Labour's going to do with power if it wins. And I'm not sure that politics is very accommodating for people who are experts. And I quite like being an expert rather than a generalist. And I wish it wasn't the case because I just think what Parliament needs is more people who are older and have expertise in certain areas to come in. But I think that's not the way the system works and that's certainly not the way the selection process works. And the selection process is quite a bad process because it puts, I mean, it's very, deter- it's a great, it's, it's very deterring for anybody who doesn't have money, who doesn't have time. Actually, I could have afforded it and I, and I have got the time to do it. But it, it attracts people who, want, who are career politicians, effectively, rather than campaigners or, um, I'll probably regret it deeply, I should think, one way or another. But then if I'd done it, I might regret that deeply too. So it was a very, very hard call. Yeah. Um, but I just, I, having worked inside and outside politics, unless you're, a sec, unless you're a minister, I think it's quite hard to have influence. And I think possibly it's easier to have influence outside as a campaigner. I could be wrong. I don't know what do other people think about it. I mean, it's a, it's a parliament full of career politicians, and I think that's what's... Select committees have influence. Hit select committees have influence. Yeah. They really are cutting up rather than our peers. They're the odd person. Well, politicians of all sides are cutting, you know. Mm. Not just the opposition. I mean, Tony Wright was obviously a very influential backbencher. Mm. He had a select committee, uh, but he was basically running the whole show himself. Mm. He was Margaret Hodges doing a fantastic yeah, job exactly. now with the public yeah. accounts committee, yeah. too. But I talked to her about it, and she said, well, the thing is, you've got to, this is definitely <laughs> off the record, but she, you know, you've got to decide if you want to just be a kind of maverick person who wants to do that, or you want to climb the greasy pole, because you want to climb the greasy pole. You've just got to toe the line, and I didn't fancy towing the line. And since I don't know what the line is, <laughs> that was a big problem. It may be in a year's time that the line becomes clear, and I would think again, but by then it will be too late for Hampstead and Kilburn. But. I, I, I'd just like to point out um, that, that in this group this evening, we actually have more elderly than young people. Mm. And I'm aware because I've got children in their, in their 40s you know, who are so consumed with their jobs mm. and with rearing children that they don't actually have time yeah. to attend meetings yeah, yeah. like this. And so when we're thinking about resources for the future, resources for schools, for colleges, for our communities, I think as a, as a group of older people, mm. you know, we, we could um, contribute quite a lot. And the yeah. issue for me is, is like, how can we do that? Mm. And how can our skills, expertise, our knowledge, our maturity be recognized? Because at one point you contradicted yourself this, this evening. You talked about the small size of classrooms mm. in public schools. And also that class size didn't matter, but that one-to-one mm. um, for young people did matter. 
So I'm thinking, you know, that's what people who are mm. in retirement age have, mm. is time. Mm. And from looking at the group here tonight, there's obviously a, a deep interest mm. in education because it, it's, it's such an important key mm. to what our future society could look like mm. to kind of reach the minds of young people. Mm. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do, actually. I thought about And one of the other things that really struck me when I was thinking about the parliamentary selection was how society really ought to accommodate itself for the fact that people whose children have grown up are going to want a third career, as it were. I mean, I'm obviously, being a woman like many other women, I made sacrifices because it's still a very gendered business, this raising children, on behalf of my children. So I sort of gave up my career and did lots of different things. And I've written a book about it, actually. But I think that women are going to, particularly women, are going to come back in their mid-50s upwards and be ready to do something else. And actually, society is not, and we'll have an awful lot to offer because they've got so many skills and experience, and everybody's going to have to work longer whether we like it or not. And society's got to be ready for this new, this you know, influx of people and accommodate them. I don't think we are ready for it yet, actually. And it's very interesting. There's still a premium on youth in a lot of walks of life, but I think that's bad and wrong because it's going to be a fantastic waste of resource. So yes, I'd be very. I think it's a really, really important issue that what happens to that group when they, you know, the healthier, living longer, got so much to contribute, how can we use it? Um, um, I'm, I'm a member of the U3A group in Cambridge, yeah. and we, we were asked uh, through a newsletter to come and help at a school mm. with um, children with reading Excellent. Um, backwardness. And there's a whole group of us now, at a primary, yeah. well, more than one primary school in Cambridge yeah. who, who are doing that. Good. And um, I go three mornings a week now yeah. um, to help. And I, you know, this has definitely had a, 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 a advantage. Yeah, I think um, it's fantastic for the school. I think. But you need somebody to broker that, don't you? Really, that, and it, it is a, It's a whole scheme, and there is someone in charge of this. And we were given training lessons yeah. on, on how to, to um, treat the children mm. for, for the reading, and um, I think it has been a, a great success. I think there is a difference, incidentally, between small class sizes and one-to-one -one tuition, because even in a small class, some children get sort of lost, and when they get one-to-one -one attention, yes. they really flourish in a way. That yes, and that, that's what the school has decided, yeah. that that was the way to bring the children on, was mm. the one-to-one. -one. They hope three mornings a week, mm. three hours. That's great. Would you say at, at the back, sorry. Being patient, which, so which way? You, okay. yeah, and then Stuart. Okay, uh, I don't think we should call it a war. No. It'll, be, it'll be dismissed as the politics of anything, yeah. and, and that will be the class it. war. But, I, but I, 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 I do think we need a new field, and I think mm. lots of what people have been saying here belong to this thought that somehow we need a new, I'm not going to call it a battlefield, but we need a new field into which all of this energy and all of this wish and hope mm. for the future. <laughs> um, can be invested and I mean the, the idea that attracts me is the idea of civil society mm. and you, you gave an example the London Challenge mm. has been extremely effective mm. at, but it is essentially an aspect of civil society mm. which actually is a socialist idea mm. mm. um, but the, the, the sort of features that I think would be important in that would be I speak as an educationist being able to put professional people in yeah. touch with stakeholders, mm. not shareholders, stakeholders in a local community which, in which there are plenty of connections with the way in which local organisations such as should have been set up by Sure Start and, and Every Child Matters but somehow have been lost to economic competitiveness. Take account of the fact that growth is not an indefinitely pursuable and sustainable Objective. We've got. We've really got to think about how much importance we can attach to the idea of growth, not least in the impact that it has in, on, on local communities. Mm. Um, so there's the, 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 where some of the complexity of com, uh, uh, the, the professionals need to deal with can be brought into contact with some of the heart and soul that local people mm. know that they have to deal with. It's those kinds of links and connections mm. that somehow have, we mm. have failed to make. <coughs> sure start could have been a, 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 mm. a, a way of doing that, but it has been so damaged that I don't know that there's any way back mm. from that. So I'm, I'm really asking for a Labour Party who will 
define another field in which there's no battle to be fought, but there is a great deal of connectedness yeah. and hopefulness to be generated. But we should have just had an example in front of you of that happening. Indeed. Yeah, that's that, so that's very encouraging. And I think yeah. I think it is going on in communities and schools. I think there are schools that are doing amazing things aren't, and are connecting there with are. their communities. Well, the trouble is they're not valued for doing that. There's and actually not, and, and, and the, the, there is no coherence. There no. is no there is no there is no political uh, organisation which says yes we mm -hmm. mandate this. It belongs yeah, to us. Just, it's part of who we are about. Take this seriously. Don't just regard it as elderly people with nothing better to do. Which, and it will be so easy to dismiss it, those, those terms. And I, I speak as an elderly person. But that's why, I mean, one, of the, one thing you could have is, sort of, is group accountability. I don't think we're going to get away from accountability. Because you, I mean, parents have a right to know how schools are doing, and you know, the taxpayer has the right to know that it's value for money. But you could have very different measures of accountability, which could judge, for example, whether mm -hmm. schools are engaging with their local communities. Stakeholder. Yeah, and one of the things I thought of is that you, know, you should have accountability which is based on the views of the community, the parents and the pupils. You know, do it on Facebook, you do it on school websites and get what people are saying about it. And then other people can look and say, oh, yeah, that looks like a very interesting one. I mean, schools are very frightened of that. They're very defensive about being opened up. Because, I mean, they're so battered now by this accountability regime. You know, you've got these offset inspectors coming in, and you get the forced academies coming in. You know, heads are just giving up. Mm. I spoke at the head teachers' conference a couple of months ago. You know, their heads are just refusing to take on difficult schools because they think they're going to fail and they'll be driven out. So I think we need to switch the accountability measures to, to a broader and more generous recognition of what a school can do. Not losing the academic stuff at all, or the English and maths, which is incredibly important. We do live in Henry, Henry Morris country, of course, and yeah. uh, we've completely forgotten about that sort of egalitarianism, that sort of community outreach thinking. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I look around now, and I, I used to be a social worker, and I try and relate to what's happening within the, the new d disparate departments, they're just not interested in working with you in any sort of informal sense. Mm. And uh, it's absurd that we haven't made these connections both in education and civil society. Mm. I mean, there's another yeah, interesting... I'm, I forgot to mention, actually, this is one of my other ideas at the moment, is about the co uh, cooperative trust schools. Is anybody a member of the cooperative party here? Mm. Yeah, OK. So I, I, I've sub put a submission into the cooperative party's policy review mm. because the cooperative party started this thing called the cooperative mm. trust school, mm. which was actually quite a good halfway house between the maintained community local authority school and the academy. Then they messed it all up, in my view, by getting into sponsoring academies, which is a very uncooperative model. So I think what Labour should do is, maybe the thing Labour should do is just get rid of it, I mean, get away from academies and community schools and just create a new type of school, which is a cooperative school, which is a sort of semi-autonomous school, yes. but based on cooperative principles. And then... And one person, one vote. Well, and links to the community. Yeah, so we'd have a cooperative governance yeah. model, and I think that would be a very attractive... And we could do the same thing with community banks, we could do yeah. the same with, thing with health centres... The, the co-op bank is... What's happening with the co-op bank? Is oh, worry. <laughs> we won't go there for a minute. Yeah. you've been working very patiently. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, yes. Well, I want to come back to the accountability. Offset has a very bad No, I'm very, I'm very pro Ofsted. In fact, every Ofsted inspection I've been through as a governor, I've been through eight, has been absolutely accurate about the school. The problem is the way the results of the inspection are now being used. Because it isn't necessary to go through a forced academy conversion to improve the school. You could, you could ally it to another very successful school. And I think, that's the, and I think it's unfortunate for Ofsted that they've been part of this sort of politicisation of the... But yeah, I agree. And if they get the quality of the inspection right, it's, yeah, it's being used. Yeah. But you do have to have accountability measures. But Ofsted could look at lots of other things. In fact, they do look at lots of other things. But you never hear about that. And they do try and look at you know, social and emotional development stuff. But. 
but could also be transformed into something that, that could be seen by everybody, including schools as something supportive yeah. rather than as punitive as it almost is now. To be Ofsted is like you know, sort of well, that's trend. bad. <laughs> well, Ofsted now is setting up their own regional director, directorates because they're trying to, Michael Walshaw wants to take over the world, and the directorates are supposed to be the supportive side of Ofsted. It seems to me there's a bit of a conflict there. I don't know how the same people can be the inspector and the support. There must be some Chinese wall that he's planning, but they think they, I, I think they recognise they've got a problem, they want to be more supportive. But I would say it would be better to have other local support networks, like the sort of school to school support, the federations, whether it's an academy chain or a local authority. You need something local that can intervene and support schools when they get into difficulties. But in some areas, we haven't got that anymore. There's a secondary school, which is an academy in Cambridge, um, with the very affluent Catherine area and very good exam results, where I'm very reliably told that they solicit donations from parents and mm. they receive over £100,000 worth really? of donations, which is very noticeable. Yeah. Do you think this is appropriate? Is no, I think it's not. It's, I hope they don't say it in their admissions criteria that you have to, because some no. schools are asking parents to donate to, in order to get a place. Uh, <coughs> well, I that's terribly that. unfair, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But I think that the pupil premium is an attempt to attempt to equalise funding isn't it so the poorer schools get more money but maybe that needs to really be given much more attention funding needs to be distributed so that it isn't unfair in that way the funding system is a bit of a mess I mean, I'm sure you know that came, you know, areas like Cambridge get very poorly funded compared to areas like London but it's all going to be redistributed away from London now so we'll be moaning soon <laughs> we'll have all the money any more? I can point to the last round or are you sufficiently <laughs> exercised by the contributions so far? Where do I, we go from now? Well, I was, I was just going to say... Well, that you're on the policy forum. Yeah, yeah. Fi a, fi a final um, thought for me in that case. If there, was, if there was something that you would really, really like to see in the next Labour manifesto, if there was one thing you could have, what, what would it be, do you think? I, can I have two things? You can have two. Okay, I think, I think, I think the idea about the bringing all schools within a fair framework is incredibly important because the unfairness is just going to get exacerbated and that won't help anybody. I, don't, I, think, I think you have diverse schools but you need to put them in the fair framework and make sure the same rules apply to everybody. And the second thing, I would go for the Tom, Tomlinson style qualification at 18 and get rid of GCSE because they're just unnecessary. And look at the problem with the English marking last year. I mean, nobody yeah. even knows if the exams mean what they're supposed to mean. It's so demoralising for the students and the families concerned and sit back and wait for the, pop for the reaction from the Daily Mail. And also there is something called Your Britain, if you're a member of the Labour Party. You, you, you can don't log to on to the Your Britain yeah, website. you don't have to be a member of the Labour Party. You, have to, you put a membership number in, and then you can put contributions into the policy debate, but I don't know if anybody ever reads them. I do, I respond to all of them. Oh, do you? Yes, I do. I'm, oh, good, I'm yeah. put, I'm put, I'll put something uh, on tomorrow morning then. But, but, you're, <laughs> but you're not in the east of England, so it won't oh, come to me. Fair but to Daniel, because he organised a very good day's discussions around the Your Britain process. Oh really? And we discussed housing. We did. Uh, tax evasion. Yes. Which I haven't done any of those. Uh, in my neck of the woods. Well, it's a very radical Protecting place. workers. Mm -hmm. Yes. We had Jack Dromey talking about housing. It was good. Oh I think housing we've got some good policies in the pipeline. We have. Mm. That's well, important. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you yeah. very much for what I think has actually been a very civilised and intelligent conversation tonight, which um, I thoroughly enjoyed. Certainly. But it was, it, do you think it was not going to be civilised? <laughs> no, I, I, had a bit of, I had a bit of a run-in with Neil Lawson at a yeah, previous event. Which, uh, uh, I'm not sure you do, really. But anyway, um, I was on good behaviour well, tonight. Well, campus, ch ch campus are starting an education commission, and I'm going on the advisory board of this. Well, that's excellent. Thank, thank you. It's in, in a good Fabian tradition, I think, tonight's discussion, and a tradition of the policy forums, yeah. actually, which is a much better way of making policy in the Labour Party, as I've been saying for 20 years, and no one wants to listen, which is why we've got another resolution to GC next week, but never mind. Um, but thank you for uh, a fantastic contribution tonight, and um, perhaps we can show our appreciation in a normal manner. Yeah.